Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to FBC Lantana. We're so glad you're with us today. Happy Sunday. Woo. Welcome to Church Online. We're so happy that you're all with us today to worship our King. Amen. Amen. How's your day going so far, right? It's awesome to be in the house of the Lord, and we're so blessed to, to have the freedom that we do to be able to worship our God, amen, and, uh, and share his love among us. Will you pray with me? Father, we just are so excited and expectant of you today. We just want to meet you, God. We want to hear your heartbeat. We want to hear your voice. We want to feel your touch. We want to leave here changed and deeper in you. And we thank you for all your plans and all your purposes today coming through. We ask that you'd receive our worship, God, because it's from our hearts. And we love you so much. And we thank you, God, that we love because you first loved us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship him. Oh, do you remember when you met him? I do. I was buried beneath my shame. to 
Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, boy is free. Shut 
of Jesus. Well, Bless good morning. You. morning. How y'all doing today? Great. great. What else besides great? How we doing? Blessed. blessed. That's a good one. I'm feeling blessed today. We can go with that. Hey, real quick, before we get started with announcements, FBC Kids, kindergarten to third grade. You can now go with Miss Patty over to FBC Kids. Her, oh, look at this. Come on. There we go. All right. All right. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We're going to bottle up their energy while we're over there, and we'll sell it later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pray, pray for Patty while you're at it. <laughs> hey, well, welcome to FBC Lantana. Whether you're here in the room, join us for church online. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Hey, and first thing I'd like you to do, if you're a first-time guest, take out your phone. That's right. Pastor's telling you to take out your phone. And I'm not going to tell you to put it on silent because we all know to do that anyways. But I want you to go ahead and go to your text messaging app. And I want you to text the word CONNECT to 561-867-3353. And if you're saying, well, wait, I didn't get that number, that's okay. Look at the back of the pew in front of you. There's a QR code. The phone number is there also. And what that is, that's a virtual connection card. So what you'll do is once you do that, you're going to get a text message back, and it's going to be a link on it. We're going to ask you for three things. We're going to ask you for your name, your phone number, and your email address. And once we get that, what that's going to do is keep you up to date on what's going on here at FBC Lantana. And some things upcoming next Saturday, we have our clothes closet. We also have our brown box food distribution. Both of them go from 9 a.m. to noon on, on Saturday. So, you know, we encourage you to come on out here. We've got some bags of clothes we still have to go through. But then at the same time, anyone who comes in is able to get five articles of clothing per person. So, so it's a way to help those who are in need. They'll come and they'll pick up a brown box of non-perishable food items, come into the clothes closet, be able to get some clothes, and, and all of it to expand the kingdom. We're here to help those who are in need, clothe those who are naked, feed those that are hungry. So doing what God called us to do. Amen. So of course, many hands make the load light. So anyone, if you if you can't be here the whole time from 9 to noon, that's okay. Just come for the amount of time that you can be here. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, with that being said, um, not this Wednesday. The following Wednesday is our monthly business meeting. And then two Saturdays from now is going to be our work day. Um, work day is going to coincide with our men's Bible study. And we had a great men's breakfast and men's Bible study yesterday because we had bacon. And bacon makes every breakfast good. Uh, we had plenty of bacon, had really good food and fellowship with each other yesterday. So I appreciate that. And, and a couple things as you're going through this week, I need you to pray for me. Um, two reasons. First re reason is I'm on call this week with the Sheriff's Department. So, you know, pray that South County behaves so I don't get them midnight calls of having to go down and, and meet with families and and second, uh, a lot of you, if you saw the email on Thursday, my, my newest grandson, Raiden, was born on Wednesday. Um, yesterday, he was life-flighted to Miami Children's Hospital, um, having problems breathing, having problems with his lungs. They've got an ultrasound team coming in today to do ultrasound. Uh, he's got some type of leak within his body, which is causing infection and stress. And at four days old, he's, he's where he needs to be. But my prayer, as always, is God to bring healing. I still believe our God heals. I still believe in miracles. Um, so I know he is still our Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Amen. So I just ask as you're going through your time, just pray for my grandson Raiden, my son Dalton, his wife Kaylee, as they, they travel each day down to Miami. Um, and that God brings healing to little Raiden. Amen? Amen? With that, let's go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and Lord, every one of us has something going on. Lord, you know what each of us has in our heart. You know what's going on. Lord, we ask that you give us peace, that you give us comfort. Lord, and as we come to worship you, that we can take that time and just 
put our worries, put our anxieties aside, and that we can truly worship you. Lord, I just continue to, to pray for all of those who have something going on in their life. Lord, we all have that stuff. So, Lord, I ask that as we come to worship you, as we come to be in your presence, Lord, that, that you'll remove that stuff and that we can truly worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, that we will seek you first in all that we do. And, Lord, that we will always remember that you are still on the throne. You are still in control. So, Lord, as we continue worship this morning, Lord, may we truly worship you with no anxiety, no worry, whatever it is, that we will put that aside and that we will worship you. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue worship. Amen. My hearts would faint as we hope to see the goodness of God here in the land of the living. Amen. Let's sing about his goodness. Oh, we love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, who oh, I will sing of the goodness.
This is a new song for us. Well, I got a story too good to hide. I was a blind man wandering till I saw the light. Yeah, I've got a story I can't deny. Nobody could tell me you could give me this freedom. Tell me you could give me this fire. Ain't nobody love me like Jesus. And I know, I know, nobody could. Ain't nobody, none of the body. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody. Now I'm anointed to bring the news. So we're in the final week of guardrails. Now, now during this series, we've kind of looked at this biblical perspective of having guardrails in our lives because we all know that, you know, sometimes we lose control. Sometimes we need something to keep us on course or to keep us where we're supposed to be going. And, and as we've gone through this series, we've kind of looked at guardrails in, in the priorities 
you know, each one of us make this priority checklist each and every day. And, and you know, we want to start the day off with, with God first. And, and so we get up in the morning and we take time in prayer and we read his word. And, and then we check the box. And then we move on to whatever the next task is. But, but God's supposed to be a part of all of it. So we looked at having them guardrails where we keep God into in all of the priorities in our life and keep him not just as a morning box that we check off. And, and then we turned around and, and we kind of looked at where God was in our thought process. You know, what are we allowing in? Just like any computer or anything else, it, it runs off of what's put in it. So we had to ask that question, what are we putting inside ourselves? You know, because ultimately if you bring garbage in, you're going to put garbage back out. So you want to take that time to really dig in and meditate on God's word so that the good stuff's coming in so good stuff comes out. And instead of the world allowing the garbage to come into our life and then we spew that same garbage into our own relationships, that, that we actually focus on our thoughts and what we do. And then last week we talked about finances, which, you know, that's the one time a year it's like, Okay, pastor's got to talk about finances, but you notice I didn't talk about tithing, so we'll talk about that later in the year. So you're not going to get away with just one time. Um, and this week I want to look at guardrails in relationships. And, and I think this is a big one because every one of us has some type of relationship in our life. Whether we're married, if we've got kids, we've got friends, we've got co-workers. So all of us have some type of relationship. And, and, and in life, people will do some crazy things for love. Crazy things have been done for love. There's been wars that have been fought over love. There's been uh, relationships lost because of love. Uh, so many different things in the name of love have caused turmoil in the world. I mean, even if you go back and you start looking like, like people like Brian Adams, he actually said in one of his songs, everything I do, I do it for you. Meatloaf would do anything for love. <laughs> see, uh, see y'all of my age, y'all know who I'm talking about, right? All the young people in the room were saying, I didn't know Meatloaf could talk. <laughs> so... But Milo said, I would do anything for love. Jerry Maguire actually professes his love for Dorothy by saying, you complete me. We can't forget Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it? And, and, and that's kind of what we're going to look at today is what's love got to do with it? And, and I think as we, we look at what love has to do with anything, as we look through all of these different scriptures or we, we look at all these different love, what the world says love is, I think it gives us a place to fail because what the world says is love and what we may think is love is totally different than what God's word calls love to be. And if we try and do anything for love, we'll do some stuff that we probably shouldn't do in the first place. And when I look at Tina Turner's song, it says this, what's love got to do with it, got to do with it? Go ahead, sing along. Uh, what's love but a secondhand emotion? You notice I'm not singing, that's not my gift. Um, what's love got to do with it, got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? She goes on to say, what's love got to do with it, what's love got to do with it? What's love but a sweet, old-fashioned notion? I think love is so much more than that. I think love is more than this old-fashioned notion. I think love is more than what the world thinks love is. I think love can truly make the world go around if it's focused on the right thing. So as we look at this today, I think as we, we look at relationships, I believe love is a place to start. Because if any relationship you truly have love in it, the chances are it's going to be a little messy, but in the long run, love will trump over everything. So, so as we look at guardrails, every guardrail we've looked at, we says needs to be centered about around Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33 tells us, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So I think any guardrail that we have first needs to include God first. We need to seek his kingdom. We need to seek 
his righteousness, and then everything else kind of works itself out. See, because what happens is we'll start seeking our own goodness. We'll start seeking our own kingdom. You know, because believe it or not, you may not think it, but every one of us has our own little kingdom. We have our own little domain that we're the king or the queen of, right? For some of us, you know, we're not at home, so we can say, I, I wear the pants of my house. And, and my wife's over an FBC kid, so I can say, I wear the pants of my house. Uh, until she comes over here and I'll be, yes, dear. <laughs> but we, we try and seek our own kingdoms and we seek our own righteousness instead of, instead of seeking his first. So one of the guardrails we've looked at in all of it is to set up that first. That needs to be the first thing in our life. And, and I think as we seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, I think it's easier to build relationships that will function properly. Now, now today the big idea is this. Every relationship we have should be viewed and filtered through the lens of the gospel. Every relationship we have. And with that being said, we can't always control how other people act or respond to us. We can't control how uh, we can control how we act and respond. And our relationship guardrails have more to do with us and our relationship with Jesus than with the other person. So with that in mind, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, if you have a Bible, open it up. I love to hear that sound, you know, people actually open up a Bible. Of course, if you're like me, you're probably breaking out a phone or a tablet or something else. Or you're just going to sit there and say, hey, Pastor, ain't it going to be on the screen? Yes, it is. Okay. And that's fine, too. But I think there's something about opening it up and, and actually reading God's Word. I think it's big instead of just having to listen Listen and read at the same time. So with that being said, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. If I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions and I give over my body in order to boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it's not boastful, it is not arrogant, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not irritable, irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, I know a lot of people, as soon as I said we're going to 1 Corinthians 13, you're like, oh, wow, that's the love chapter. Isn't that what we read at weddings? Isn't that what we see on cards? And, and yeah, I would agree with that, but I honestly think 1 Corinthians 13 is, is way more than about weddings. I think it's more than just a good word to put on a card. I think 1 Corinthians 13 shows us how we should love. It shows us what love really is. It, it shows us the kind of love that God has for us. And the same type of love is we try and be Christ-like that we should have for other people. That, that we should be able to do exactly what 1 Corinthians 13 calls us to do. And, and I think if we look at any relationship we're in, and we actually went down this list and, and not only asked the question, but actually answered the question truthfully. So any relationship you're in, ask yourself, am I patient? Am I patient with this other person? Exactly. Am I kind? Probably not. Do I envy? Do I boast? Am I arrogant? Am I rude? Do I insist in my own way? Am I irritable? Am I resentful? Do I rejoice at wrongdoing or with the truth? And I think how we respond to these is going to tell you what type of relationship that is. Because a lot of us will sit there and say, well, you know, I'm kind of this with this person, but not really like this with the other person. And, and you know, I, I try to be kind, but man, pastor, they just irritate me. They just irritate me so much. and They don't understand me and, and they don't let me get my way. Well, that's not love. That's not what, what God's love calls us to be able to do. It's not the way that we're called to actually live our life. You see, each one of us have fruits. 
that we, we should be bearing in our life. And I kind of think of it, you know, we're in South Florida, so you think of a grapefruit tree. If a grapefruit tree is planted in the right environment and it has the right nutrition to it, it's going to bear grapefruit, right? Key lime tree, key lime tree, orange tree, orange tree, that's what happens, right? They bear the fruit they're called to bear. Well, what about us? And I honestly think that if we're planted in the right place, that we have the right spiritual nourishment, that we can actually bear the fruit that we're called to bear. We can actually bear what we're called to bear. And I believe that's what we experience with the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit comes into our life and, and we may be doing things we shouldn't do and it, it kind of convicts us, but it doesn't condemn us. What the Holy Spirit does is brings these fruits into our life. And Galatians 5, and 23 tells us this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, when you look at your life, do you have all them? No? Sometimes? Maybe? When I first wake up in the morning? As the day goes on, I drive 95 in South Florida. Some of it goes away pretty quick, especially the whole patience part. Uh, the love part, well, I can love them because they love me, or I can love them because, you know, they happen to like the same things I like. Well, that's not what love is. That's not doing what God called us to do. And, and I think we give a bad witness when we do this. And, and I think when we don't have those fruits of the Spirit is, is when the Holy Spirit really starts to convict us. And, and instead of condemning us, kind of shows us, hey, you know what, maybe you got a little bit of pride in your life. Maybe you got a little bit of unforgiveness going on. Maybe you've got this or that going on in your life, and it's actually stealing your joy. It's stopping you from being able to love. It's stopping you from being able to be patient, and you need to take care of this in order to have these fruits because each one of us is called to have these fruits of the Spirit. We should be able to live our life with them. The problem is we fail. But that's okay. Just so you know, I'm right there with you. I fail myself, but I think as we look at these today and we talk about the relationship side of it, the realization is every relationship has conflict. Every relationship. It don't matter how long you've been there, because here's the reality. Anytime you spend a lot of time with somebody, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be things that you don't agree on. There's going to be things that you may not see eye to eye on. Um, and whether it's a spouse, whether it's a coworker, you know, I've said it before, most of us will spend more time at work than we do at home awake. So our coworkers actually get more quality time with us than our significant other, which is pretty crazy. So that means Alfredo gets more time with me than I do with my own bride. I need to switch that up. I need a new secretary. I need to bring my wife to be my secretary so I can get time. But, but we have this conflict. We have it with our children. We, we have it wherever we go. And, and I think that the realization is disagreements aren't always the issue. Because we're going to have disagreements in life. We may not agree with everything. But the disagreement is not the issue. It's how you reacted to that disagreement. As I said, and that's when the fight started, because when that disagreement happens, you choose where you're going to go with it. How you react and what you do in that disagreement is either going to take you to the fight or to reconciliation. It's going to take you one way or the other. And I think a lot of times what happens is because we have all this stress from the world on top of us, instead of looking and saying, hey, hold up, We're, let's figure this out. We get angry, and we allow anger to guide our conversation. We allow anger to be the words that come out of our mouth. And Ephesians 5.33 says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And here's the reality. There's a wise guardrail right there. That is a wise guardrail to put inside your life. Be angry, but don't sin. See, don't say you can't be angry, that angry is a sin, because anger happens. It's how you do and what you do with 
that anger whether you make whether you sin with it or not. I think sometimes we, we get so angry and we don't realize when something's going on, but understand that sometimes during an argument, you just got to take a break. And for married couples, this is a good thing to actually talk about beforehand. Say, hey, you know what? If we have this disagreement, we may have to table it for just a little bit. And I'll tell you, Patty's so good at that because Patty, I know when she's upset because she like cleans. She's like lifting up furniture, cleaning everything, you know, she, 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 and, and I, all of a sudden I realize, oh, and it's automatic what I do wrong. Cause I figure it's gotta be me. You know, I had to have done something wrong, not the four kids or the grandkids. It has to be me. And, and so uh, I'll sit and, and it's so funny because she'll be, give me a minute to get my words right. Give me a minute to get my words right. And it's so funny because I was never like that. You know, I'm one of them. It's like it came out of my mouth and I thought I was thinking it, but I actually said it. And then you can't take it back. Well, well, Patty's the total opposite. She's let me think about it. But here's the other thing. It drives me nuts because I'm like, well, no, let's resolve this and move on. And then I got to wait. But the, the fact that she will actually take time to get the words right. Because what happens is when we just throw them words out there, we can't take them back. And words hurt. What you say, what you do, your actions can hurt someone well beyond when the day that you said them. Ask anyone, back on June 5th, 1982, you said this to me. It's the truth, right? I've heard that. I remember, and it's amazing when someone gets mad how good their memory gets. Because they remember everything. I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. But they'll remember everything. And, and I think a lot of times, even with this anger, when we approach a, a significant other with it, we, we will say things that we shouldn't say. So, so as a married couple, I tell you one good piece of advice is let each other know, hey, we might have to table this. Just let me get the words to say. Let me get my emotions in check before I say or do something that we're going to regret. And then move forward with that. Now, the same thing. You come home from work. You've had a bad day. And you find out, you know, you wait till dad gets home. And then dad gets home. And now we're just angry because you've irritated mom all day long. So what do we do? We get that switch. And out of anger, we just start disciplining our kids. Take time and get rid of the anger first. Discipline a kid with anger is not going to get the results that you actually want. You think about discipline should be what? Redemptive. It should have a redemptive purpose for it. When you actually discipline someone in anger, there is no redemption involved in it. So sometimes you need to take that time and put that anger away. Take a time out. Go count to 10. Whatever it is, go cast a fish in line for a little bit, do something to get rid of the anger before you start disciplining your children or, or in any relationship, just breathe. Take time to take a breath. Take that time just to breathe, to be able to, I don't want to sin in my anger. And, and truly take that time. Um, remember, I think all of us could take time to memorize James 1.19. Not only memorize it, maybe put it up someplace where you can read it every day. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. I think we read that backwards or in our life we do it backwards, you know, because we're quick to get angry. We're really quick to speak. The only thing we are is we're slow to listen. You know, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. We should listen twice as much as we talk. The problem is we talk twice as much as we listen. Or, or when we listen, we only hear the parts that we want to hear. And then we wonder that's why the fight started, because we only heard what we wanted to hear. We, we didn't actually take the time to, to listen to the person we're talking with. And, you know, I, I think uh, as we look at this, a lot of times we just got to ask ourselves, 
to just pause. You think about at work, you get an email, or maybe you get this text message, and you're real quick, oh, that's it, and you hit all caps, and you start writing your reply. You know, because when it's all caps, you're yelling, and some people drive me nuts. They do everything in all caps, and I think they're yelling at me, and they're really not. They just don't know how to turn the caps off. And, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you know, and you get all fired up, and then you hit send. That's just like the words that came out of your mouth. Here's something to try next time you're angry and you're, you're writing his response in anger. Sit there and get it all typed out. Read it and say, what would I do if I got this reply? And if that reply is going to get you madder than you already are, guess what? Don't send it. Because all you're doing is you're adding fuel to the fire. You're, you're going to do something and you're going to make this get worse and worse and you're going to blow up this situation and... and Instead of taking that time to just listen to what God's telling you to do, I got to be right. That's it. I'm sending this response right now. And I will let you know if you send an email and you try and recall it, if the person already opened it, guess what? They already saw it. So just so you know, I think it's funny anytime someone recalls a message, I laugh. I'm like, I already saw it. It don't matter. You can recall it all day long. Think before you act. Actually think about it. Take that moment just to sit down and, and breathe. And especially if you have for, for married couples. Um, I think it's funny in married couples with the way we kind of do life. And Ephesians 5.33 tells us to sum up each one of you is to love his wife as himself. And the wife is to respect her husband. Now all the men in the house, you're going to be like, yeah, you hear that? You respect your husband. Respect your husband. That's what it says right there, right? Respect your husband. Hey, men, what does it tell us we should do? Love his wife as himself. Do you love yourself? See, that's the problem. Some of y'all don't love yourself, so you can't love your wife the way you love yourself because you don't love yourself. You don't love what you're doing. You don't love the lifestyle you got. You just, man, I hate myself, but I got to love my wife. Jesus also tells that we should love our wives the way he loved the church. So then, of course, on the flip side of this, all the ladies are like, mm-hmm. Did you love me the way Jesus loved the church? You're not doing your part, so guess what? I'm not going to respect you because you're not loving me as you love yourself. You're not loving me as Jesus loved the church. Guess what? Here's a news flash. When you get to heaven... Men first, when you get to heaven, God is not going to ask you, did your wife respect you? He's not going to ask you that. You know what he's going to ask you? Did you love your wife the way I love the church? And here's the reality. No, I didn't because she didn't respect me. Ah, did you love your wife the way I love the church? You've got to answer for yourselves. Wives on the other side of it. I ain't going to respect him because he don't love me like the church. You get to heaven, God's going to say, hey, did you respect your husband? No, because he didn't. Uh-uh. Did you respect your husband? Each one of us controls what we do. We can't control somebody else. So men, don't be telling your wives, you got to respect me because God's going to ask you what? If you loved your spouse the way he loved the church. Did you love your wife the way you loved yourself? And if you don't love your wife the way you love yourself, find out why. What in yourself is that bad that you can't love yourself? And start to change yourself from the inside out and, and do what you're called to do. See, because every one of us has a different perspective in life. Here's a reality. We could go to an art gallery, and we could walk through that art gallery, and, and Patty would be going, oh, my God, look at this painting. This is the best painting. Oh, my God, the, just the brush strokes there. I'm going to look at it and be like, kindergarten could do better with finger paint. And the reality is we, we see things differently. But now what's going to happen is, is I'm going to try and convince her that a kindergartner could paint better than what's on the wall. She's going to try and convince me that that is the best art out there in the world. Because here's a reality check. What we see and what we do, how we think something looks or how we think it should be is our own personal reality. 
It's our own personal reality on the perspective that we see and what we do in life. It's our reality, not someone else's. But the problem is we try and make it everyone else's reality. And, and we're all built differently. So don't try and just say so because I said this is beautiful. You have to think it's beautiful. Not going to happen. I was born and raised in South Florida. I hate the ocean. I hate the ocean. I would rather be up in the Carolinas, up in the mountains any day. And the problem is because I've been around the ocean so much, I'm kind of tired of it. I don't even go to the beach. Uh, I refuse to because I grew up on the beach. But now for someone else, say someone's from, from the Midwest or, or from somewhere else and they moved to Florida, it's like, oh, my God, sunrises. They're so beautiful. They get old. <laughs> Even though they're new every day, they kind of get old. You know, you've seen so many of them in, in 58 years living here. You know, I've seen a whole lot of sunrises. I would prefer to watch a sunset in the mountains than a sunrise at the ocean. That's just me. So all of y'all need to come to my reality, and no one needs to go to the beach anymore. <laughs> okay? Is that going to happen? Probably not. Okay, because that's my reality, it's not your reality. Um, how we see and process something is our own reality. So I think a wonderful guardrail to be understood is actually realizing that we're not always going to see eye to eye. Our perspective is always not going to be the same, but the one thing we should always have in common is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and that common denominator of being like Jesus and that requires us to be selfless. It, retire, it requires us to, to look to someone else's needs instead of our own. It requires us to be different in, in every relationship that we come into. So we need to seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. So what's love got to do with it? Well, I think love has everything to do with it. If you go back to the very first three verses that I read today. Hey, Micah, I know I don't have them there, but can you bring them back for me? It says this. If I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions and I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So if you have not love, you're nothing but a noisy gong. You're a clanging cymbal. You actually are nothing and you gain nothing. Think about that. Now, here's the reality. A lot of us as Christians are going around doing that right there. We are a clanging cymbal. And every time I think about this, I think of the little toy monkey that has the cymbals and the weird looking <laughs> face on it. And, and, and here's the reality. A lot of us as Christians, are that's what we are. We're out there. We're saying, oh, well, I'm a Christian. And, and we talk the talk. But man, we don't walk that walk. And people see through us, and then all we're doing is we're making a whole bunch of noise for nothing. And meanwhile, people are running away as soon as you say you're a Christian. <gasps> They're automatically judging you because they assume you're judging them. They automatically assume you're a hypocrite because that's what the world tells them we are. And the problem is because we don't love. We don't love the way Jesus loves us. We don't love other people we're nothing but noisy and loud. And, and if you really don't think so, here's a challenge. Take a look at your last post or comments on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever social media site you use. And ask yourself, am I showing love? Am I truly showing love in this comment? Am I truly showing love in this post? Because here's the reality, in, in, in life, some of us have posted stuff in the past, and I know I see it, where I look at it, and I'm like, Ugh. hey, that's their life. I'm not getting involved. But we will make comments, man, we are like commandos on a keyboard. 
because no one can see us. They just see this fake image of us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram of this person that lives this great life, and, and we say even in our bio that we're a Jesus follower, and we spew hatred in every post that we do or every comment we do. We hold grudges with people, including our brothers and sisters in Christ, because we have a disagreement, or maybe just because we didn't get our way. I didn't get what I wanted in church, so I'm going to be mad. I didn't, you didn't do what I wanted you to do, so I'm going to be upset, and I'm going to hold this grudge against you. And, and here we're supposed to be more like Jesus, and we're supposed to be Christ followers, and we will belittle a brother and sister in Christ quicker than anybody else. And then the worst thing is we don't even think twice about it. Oh, well, you're a Christian. You're supposed to forgive me, right? That's what we're supposed to do. I can do what I want, and you just forgive me for whatever I did. And unfortunately, this is a cycle that continues to go on. And then you wonder why people don't want to come to church. And you wonder why people don't want to be a Christian. And yet God's Word tells us to do the total opposite. It tells us to love one another. It tells us to love our enemies. It tells us to love our neighbors. It tells us to love our spouses. It tells us to love. How are you doing with that? How are you doing at loving your enemies? Some of us can't even love our neighbors. Our literal next door neighbors, we can't even love. They're encroaching on my property. I can't believe they put that fence up. I can't believe, oh, they're parking their boat halfway in my yard. We, we come up with all these excuses, but the reality is we're called to love them. We're called to love our enemies. It doesn't mean we agree with what they do, but we're still called to love our enemies. I mean, this is Pride Month. I ain't going there, but this is Pride Month. And, and a lot of you know, and I've said it before, my sister lives an alternate lifestyle. I love my sister. I do not condone what she does. I do not condone her lifestyle. But I still love her. I let her know that I love her, and I let her know that I pray for her each and every day. And my prayer is that, hey, we were raised in the same house. I know she got drugged to church just like I did. My prayer is that one day she will recognize the sin in her life, and she will change and come back with a relationship with Jesus. That's my prayer. I'm not going to get on her. I'm not going to, oh, I hate your lifestyle, so I hate you. No. I still need to love her for who she is. I still need to love the person for who they are because something that everyone in life wants is we want to feel known, noticed, and loved. Love plays a big part in every single relationship we have, and we, unfortunately, as Christians, fail to show love. We fail to do what God's called us to do. So how are you showing, how are you doing with your love? Really ask yourself, how am I doing with loving others? How am I doing loving like Jesus? Do you really love the way that Jesus loves? Yesterday in our men's study, we actually talked about how Satan, when he, when he went after the Israelites, he, he destroyed generations at a time. If you look in the world today, Satan is winning because Satan is destroying a generation at a time. He, he's taking that time and he's disrupting what is family. He's allowing the world to win. He's allowing the, the fruits of the world to outbeat the fruits of the Spirit. He's allowing people to come in and to break up families to where he's slowly eliminating a generation. We got boys who don't know if they're boys or girls. We got girls who don't know if they're a girl or a boy. And they're making what the world says is right is wrong according to God's word. But they're saying it's right and God's word is wrong. And we as Christians are failing because we're not showing love. Instead, we will spew hate. Oh, the, the rainbow is the sign that, uh, from Noah. You know, it's a sign from God that... that yeah, he gave to Noah, and, and I can't believe Pride Month took it. You know what? Show them the love of God through the rainbow. Show them the love of God in everything that they do. Guess what? They didn't steal it. The rainbow is still a sign from God. 
but we will spew hate on someone instead of loving them. Love the person, actually be Jesus-like to somebody. And you might be surprised how much that conversation may change or how much they change, and maybe their view of Christianity would actually change if we actually love like Jesus. The reality is this. Every relationship we have should be viewed, filtered through the lens of the gospel. God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on a cross for you. Knowing you were a sinner, Christ died for you. That's how we should have treat every relationship. That's how we should live our life, knowing that Jesus died on the cross for us, even though we were sinners, even though we fell short of the glory of God, he still willingly went to the cross for us. We won't willingly walk across the street for someone that we don't agree with. Because we refuse to love the way Jesus loved. What if we ever, as a church, actually loved like Jesus? Yeah, one of the things here, FBC Lane 10, a place to learn, live, and what? Love. And what do we do? We want to love like Jesus. I fail at that. I'm going to be quite honest. I fail at loving like Jesus. I, I fail at always, you know, being peaceful. I, I fail at all these things, but thank God for his forgiveness. Thank God for the Holy Spirit guiding my life that I'm able to, to actually take that time. And, and Lord, I, I know I messed up. Teach me to love giving me the ability to uh, avoid going, did that really come out of my mouth? Giving me that ability to just pause before I say anything. But I fail. I, I fall short. Jesus needs to be a part of every aspect of our life. What's love got to do with it? If you're a Christ follower, it's got everything to do with it. It's got everything to do with every process of your entire day. Jesus isn't just a box that we check off in the morning. Jesus should be that box that we check off with every other box in our life. Was Jesus the center of my life? Yes. Was Jesus the center of my family? Yes. Was Jesus the center at my work day? Yes. Was Jesus, a, yes, yes, you should be able to mark Jesus off every place you go. See, but we fail, and Satan is winning the game, not only with a generation, but even as Christ followers, different denominations, we can't even get along. Oh, we're Baptists. What do you mean that Lutheran church down the street? They're kind of weird. What do you mean that Catholic church next door? No way. No way. Oh, Episcopalians? Nope, they're out. Nope, we can't, we can't do it. I'm sorry, we're Baptists. Like, we're going to have our own heaven. <laughs> like, guess what? We're all going to be there together. You're going to be up there, going to be a Catholic right next door to you. Going to be, you know, he's got a mansion with many rooms. Going to get up there, and you're going to have a, a Pentecostal living next to you. <gasps> Pentecostals. Not them people. But here's the reality. We can't even spend time together here and we will actually argue about things that make zero sense. But what if we, as the body of Christ, actually acted like Jesus? And we actually came together to show the love of Christ in every place that we went. Imagine the difference we could make, not only in our own households, but every environment we go into because what's love got to do with it? Everything. It's not an old-fashioned notion. It's not just a, uh, an emotion. Love conquers hate. Love conquers hate. Love can conquer anything that we go through. You know, and for some of us, it's time to eat crow. Time to eat crow and go, go give that forgiveness and say you're sorry or whatever it may be. 
It's time to swallow that pride. It's time to swallow that anxiety, whatever it is going on in your life, and, and realize that you just need to give it up. Let go and let God. I want to encourage you this week, take time and actually ask yourself, do I have the fruits of the Spirit or the fruits of the world? In other words, do you love or do you hate? Do you have joy or do you feel hopeless? Do you have peace or do you have fear, patience or resistance? Do you have kindness or harshness? Goodness or evil, faithfulness, unfaithfulness, self-control, or do you lose control? See, for many of us, they might say, well, half of the list I was pretty good. Half's not good enough. We're either all in or you're out. Remember, the Bible's black and white. We make this gray area that's like the size of a superhighway to fit our own personal agendas. It's black and white. Sin is sin. No matter what it is. Sin is sin. So instead of just going around the world trying to make up our own ways, why don't we go around the world and actually love the way Jesus loved us? And in order to love the way Jesus loves you, it starts with a personal relationship with Jesus. It starts with realizing that you're messed up, realizing that you're jacked up, and realizing that you don't have your whole life together, but that he still loves you. See, a lot of people will say, man, I can't come to church because I'll catch on fire. Well, come on, because I ain't seen it happen yet. I'm waiting for the day for someone to come through that door and actually catch on fire. I'll be able to be, well, it's right. I really don't think it's going to happen. But we'll have people that will say that, and I tell them all the same thing. Well, come on, I want to see it happen. We got fire extinguishers. Or we take the total opposite. Well, let me get things right first. You know, I'm just messed up. And, and let me get my life together because Jesus won't accept me the way we are. Well, newsflash, God's word says we're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. So guess what? The person sitting next to you is a sinner and falls short of the glory of God. No matter how much they may think they don't, they do. Every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us falls short of the glory of God. But yet God showed his love for us that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And God's word says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, that's where it starts. That, that's that begin of, hey, I need to love like Jesus. I, I need to start understanding what that is because once you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, he sends the helper. He sends the Holy Spirit, which brings the fruit of the Spirit. And then you start to change your life. Now, I'm going to tell you, for some people, yes, it can happen like that. For me, it took a while. Maybe I'm just a slow learner. Maybe I was just hard-headed. But it took me a while. And guess what? It's still a process because I still mess up. I'm still messed up. I'm still jacked up, but my God still loves me. And I try and live my life each and every day to be better today than I was yesterday. And work on being more like Jesus in everything that I do. Especially in relationships. So I want to urge this day that if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, God's word says today is the day of salvation. You can do it today. During our final worship song, we'll have... Uh, myself, some prayer partners will be up here. And, and if you need to accept Jesus, take that walk down front. Come down here, take time. We will talk with you, pray with you, pray for you. And you can become part of our messed up, jacked up family today. You can become part of it. And know you're in good company. Just look around the room. You can probably look around and say, man, they look like some messed up people in here. Yes, we are. And I want to also encourage you, if, if you're not living out love the way it calls us to love in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 
the same thing. You can come up here at the end of service after this final worship song and, and we'll pray with you. We'll talk to you about it and, and, and help you to try and move forward. It is a process. But I want to encourage you, don't leave here today still angry at somebody. Don't leave here today without knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Make whatever move it is that God prompts you to make that move today. Make sure you've got that right relationship because here's a little key for you. If you and your spouse for the married couple are both following Jesus, instead of looking this way at each other, as you guys are looking up and you get closer to Christ, you actually get closer to each other. And a lot of relationships don't work because one person's focusing on Christ and the other is not, and it actually brings separation in that family. Focus on Jesus first in everything that you do. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you that your love is unconditional, Lord. Lord, we put so many conditions on so many things. Lord, we'll put conditions on our relationships. we put conditions on our kids, on our loved ones, on our spouses. And Lord, and, and then we will tell someone that, oh, we'll love you if. Well, we keep it in our own mind. I'm only going to love them if they do this or if they do that. And, and Lord, every one of us fail at it. Lord, help us to love the way you love. Help us to see people the way that you see people. Lord, that, that we will treat people with love, respect, dignity. Lord, because everyone just wants to be known, noticed, and loved. Help us to love like you. Help us to build our relationships around you. Help us to put these guardrails in our lives that we're first seeking you and your kingdom and your righteousness because, Lord, you make everything else work out. Lord, if there's anyone here today that does not know you, Lord, I ask that you, you have the Holy Spirit make them move. That today would be the day of salvation. That they would accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. And, Lord, as you begin to change them from the inside out, that they will change and affect change in their households, their environments, and every place they go. And, Lord, for those of us that know you, that are failing to show love, Lord, I ask that you help us to love the way that you love. Help us to be the change we want to see in this world. Lord, I ask that you continue to not only speak to us, but speak through us. And Lord, that your name will be glorified through it all. And make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Hey, thanks again for joining us here today at FBC Lantana for Church Online. And, and, and if, if you enjoyed what you saw today, I'd just like to ask you to go ahead, go to our website and, and help support this ministry as we try and outreach and reach the lost for Jesus Christ. And you can just go to our website, fbclantana.com slash give, um, and you can make an online donation right there. Again, I encourage you to get connected to a local church, and especially if during this message you felt compelled to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, definitely go tell somebody. Let someone know because that is the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. And, and from there, get connected to a local church. Hey, we would love to provide you with some resources with that. You can go to our website, fbclantana.com, and on the very front page, you say, Give my life to Jesus. Click on there, and at the bottom of there, there's some links and some good information for you. And just wanted to say, welcome to the family.